And we are live. Uh, welcome to uh, our session at Horasis, uh, creating global social awareness about sustainability. And I am very pleased uh, from this early morning uh, in Seattle uh, to be joined by uh, Luis Kaufman and, and Cass Geis, where we all really re want to be, uh, and hopefully will be uh, next year. Uh, Felix coming in from uh, the UK and Mauricio from, from Brazil. And uh, each of you can uh, give introductions uh, uh, and talk a little about your background uh, when we get to your, your, your parts. Um, but I I'm so glad that this is a topic at Horasis uh, this year. Uh, this is actually 50 years after the first major international conference in Stockholm. Uh, so there are going to be a lot of celebrations happening in, in just uh, two more weeks. And that helped uh, put environment uh, into the consciousness of global leaders uh, as well as in the general public. And I think we've, we've been reaping the benefits you know, from that type of social awareness uh, over the years. But I think the first question is, why is social awareness of sustainability important? Uh, and unpacking that a little bit, uh, because we, we maybe take that for granted, that it is important. Uh, but if you look at, uh, obviously, uh, the, the public's uh, ability to affect uh, public policy uh, in making key decisions, uh, how do we uh, choose our political representatives? Um, how does sustainability enter into uh, that, that factor of choice? Um, how do we represent our opinions after we elect these, these public officials who oftentimes uh, pay very close attention to uh, public uh, opinion polls. Um, how do we work as individuals uh, inside uh, organizations, be that in the public sector, in the private sector, uh, non-governmental organizations, or as an investor? Uh, how do we bring our uh, personal awareness uh, and sensibilities uh, into the workplace and affect the, the workplace environment. Um, and then how do we behave as consumers? How do we take our values into uh, the uh, shopping that we do, uh, into the choices we make that have economic impacts? So for all of those reasons, social awareness is really kind of the foundation that supports uh, the policies and actions uh, that uh, we need uh, to get the world uh, to where it needs to be. And I think one of the th things we'll be able to highlight today is kind of the whole ebb and flow uh, around climate change. And I think we can point to this as, as a real success. And it was not set up for success uh, in, in the beginning. Um, so I look forward to, to that, that conversation. Um, and one of the challenges we have uh, is that uh, a lot of the insights around sustainability come from people like myself. Uh, so people with PhDs who are scientists and who are really into the details and think very sincerely, if we only tell people the facts, they will be rational actors. They will make the right decisions uh, and end of story. Uh, but people like myself being scientists typically are bad communicators. Uh, we, we're, we're scientists for a reason. We like to be holed up in a laboratory <laughs> away from people. Uh, and sadly, the people who tend to be good communicators are a little shy when it comes to science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM. Um, so we need the strengths of both types of people both halves of our brains uh, to look at the facts, to look at the science, and then think about how can we communicate that in, in effective ways. And this uh, lack of combination of, of diverse skills, um, so different technical backgrounds, different uh, ethnic backgrounds, uh, different life experience, <laughs> different international uh, uh, points of view, uh, these, I think, have, have impeded our ability to create uh, a more uh, solid global awareness of sustainability. And I think we're getting a little better uh, as time has gone on. Um, and I think that, again, the, the, the climate change uh, issue 
uh, can can illustrate that. So uh, before we, I hand it over to, to Felix to talk about the climate part, I'd just like to share um, a little diagram. It's going to be a little maybe hard to read, um, but hopefully uh, illustrative of what we're talking about. Uh, so this is basically a, a graph, which is really fun to do. It's called a, 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 a Google n-gram, and it looks at the usage of uh, terms in uh, various publications. Um, and what you'll see uh, is that, again, 50 years ago uh, in, um, in Stockholm, uh, there's very little use of terms like sustainability or climate change. Um, and as we go through time, we see that usage increase. And I would argue that there are certain events that put this into the minds of uh, political leaders, such as the Earth Summit back in 1992, uh, and the creation uh, of uh, the United Nations Framework on uh, Global Climate Change, the UF, uh, UNFCCC, which is actually the screen poster behind me. Um, and then you'll notice there's a real increase uh, in the slope of the use of climate change right after Al Gore's movie, Inconvenient Truth in receiving the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, so that seems to really have entered into the, the public consciousness uh, through uh, those more um, kind of popular means of communication through movies uh, versus just uh, scientists talking to themselves or politicians talking to themselves. And it seems to me that and on this graph that sustainability um, has benefited you know, from that climate experience uh, and, and vice versa, that in the beginning, we're talking about sustainable development. So this term down here uh, was all the rage around the Earth Summit time, because it was actually the United Nations a Conference on Sustainable Development. And that was kind of the term of art. And there are actually two main uh, focuses at the conference, climate change and biodiversity. And you can see there's a big spike in, in biodiversity as a term around that time, but that's kind of leveled off right now. And, and, and maybe a signal that it's something that we need to be more thoughtful in, in communicating. And then global warming again, was kind of a term of art back uh, at the Earth Summit days uh, and you know, had its little bump here after the inconvenient truth. But then you, you notice that it's kind of leveled off and, and it faded away. And I also wanna call out one last term here, environmental justice very much at, at, at the bottom. Uh, and I, I uh, predict that we're going to see a spike in the use of the term environmental justice uh, because sadly, uh, a lot of this conversation uh, has been dominated you know, by people like on the panel today, you know, white uh, men who are, who are not necessarily young at, at, at the current time. And um, using our, our best efforts to solve these problems, we see them as technical problems or economic problems uh, without necessarily see, seeing all of the uh, myriad impacts that they have uh, and how it affects people's lives and making sure that as we go through and develop solutions, that we're aware of how it affects people's lives that are different from the lives that, that we know uh, and make sure that there is environmental justice and that the, the burden uh, of these changes don't fall on uh, the poor and disenfranchised. So uh, the, the Biden administration here in the United States, I think, is a great example of really putting a very strong focus on environmental justice. So I think uh, we'll see uh, more uh, in the use of, of that term. So what I'd like to do is hand it over to, to Felix, um, who's had a great and long experience in uh, clean tech investment. Uh, and particularly with regard to climate. Felix? Great, thanks very much. And, you know, good to be part of this discussion today. Um, just before, maybe give you a brief introduction about my background, which you just alluded to. Looking at the slide you just put up, if global warming is that far down the pecking order, I think we still have a long way to go in order to solve the climate crisis. Climate change sounds obviously much prettier and sustainability as well than global warming, which actually 
puts the you know makes it clear what the real issue here is. Um, but look, just just back to maybe just a very brief introduction about you know what led me to to being here today. I started a, a clean tech fund in the late '90s when sort of environmental technologies and and climate wasn't pretty high on the agenda as we just saw. Um, but obviously, you know, we saw market opportunity. We saw that this will have to develop. Question obviously was for everyone: How quickly will it develop? And that's um, um, part of that. We also invested very early on in the in the um, in the climate change industry, if you want, or into the carbon offsetting industry, which obviously is part of the solution. And then, just uh, to concluding the circle. I'm now investing in technology companies, again, invested, uh, focused on, on climate tech, but looking at it from a very different angle, looking at it from space. So space technologies linked to climate tech. So it's quite interesting that after 25 years, there seems to be sort of a, a full circle of, uh, of what's happening out there. But look, I wanted to give you a, a specific example of one of the companies I've been involved with in, uh, early on, which I think might be a good example of the topic we have here, which is social awareness about sustainability and climate change. It's a company that at the time was a business plan and called Future Forest, investing effectively in planting trees um, uh, with the idea of mitigating uh, impact from, from emissions. Um, and the idea was, look, let's bring a few celebrities on board, um, you know, let's plant a few trees and sort of very... Um, uh, interesting spots next to motorways and uh, and change the world thereby. Um, and then we came in as sort of um, a professional investor and said, look, great idea, but, you know, we've got to turn this into something really different and much bigger. We need to go into the industries. We need to go into large corporates. We need to, if we want to have a real impact, we need to be core of what a corporate does turned uh, the company into, into uh, what we then called uh, a carbon neutral company and even managed to trademark, tells you how far we were at the time, we managed to trademark the term carbon neutral. Uh, you know, unheard of, but, you know, that was granted at the time, which tells you how, how little development, how little awareness there was of this, of this terminology at the time. And today this company is providing climate solutions for some of the largest corporates on the earth. And the idea is to, to not just trying to be good citizens and trying to reduce carbon emissions, but putting a cost to CO2 emissions. That's uh, what we at the time, and I still think today, think is so relevant. If you have a cost attached to emitting CO2, not just for the few polluting industries that are regulated in Europe, but really across the board for everything we're doing, only if we get there will behavior change. I think. And that's the idea. If corporate suddenly needs to put uh, a line into their cost um, uh, basis on climate related activities, guess what? Everybody will try to reduce CO2 emissions in order to save cost. And that's exactly where, where we want to be and where we want to change. An interesting example, I saw an article about this restaurant, I think in Vienna, um, that put CO2 emissions next to every single plate they were offering. So obviously the, the, the beef fillet, you know, was all the way up there in terms of CO2 emissions and your, your veggie aubergine dish was, was pretty low. And it's interesting, changes behavior very, very quickly, having that visibility and putting a price tag attached to it. And then, you know, I won't, don't want to be too long, but um, as, as I mentioned earlier, investing in space now, so one of our companies in the space portfolio um, is providing services to the carbon offset providers. So they're working with the likes of Natural Capital Partners and others, trying to confirm if that tree that was planted, if that forest that was planted, if that red project, red being the, you know, um, avoiding deforestation and degradation of forests, particularly in the Amazonian, um, how do you prove that? without sending you know, uh, an army of people out every five years and hoping for the best, how can you actually check that every minute of the day, every week? Um, how can you make sure that it's actually biodiverse enough? How can you make sure that that's all, being, uh, all still there? Only satellite imagery can help you with that. And you know, if we can combine technology 
with awareness and with a price tag on it, I think that's where we can really make a difference. But again, looking at your global warming, a packing order, where to go. Right. And, and I think that that was um, interesting, uh, maybe a zero sum between those two terms of uh, global warming uh, and then, you know, climate change and having the, the multitude effects, not just the, the warming uh, effect um, on, on the planet. And Felix, you, you mentioned two, two things that I just thought were really interesting. Um, one is you're talking about uh, space uh, technology, and um, that reminds me of that, that picture that the astronauts took from the moon uh, of the Earth, you know, uh, back in the late 60s on one of the Apollo missions, and seeing that Earth as that, that you know, fragile, beautiful object uh, in space. Um, and um, that, I think, helped to kind of you know, raise that, that kind of uh, awareness uh, about uh, the fragility of our planet and, and the thinness of, of our atmosphere uh, that enables all of our, our life. And that's a powerful form of, of communication. So that, that image which conveys the, the data um, is, is, is really uh, very, very powerful. And the other point I, I like that you, you made is uh, you know, putting out a price on carbon, for example, uh, and, and using cost as, as, as language, uh, as a signal uh, to people either on a menu or in, in a corporate that there's, there's something going on here. There's an actual you know, cost associated with that. And if that can be incorporated into their consciousness, they're going to make different decisions. Um, so thank you for, for your comments, Felix. And that, that sets up our, our next conversation with, with uh, Luis very well, uh, talking about what happens within uh, the, the corporate environment uh, and how do those uh, how, how does that language of cost uh, enter in uh, and, and create a greater awareness around sustainability within a corporate environment? Luis? Okay, Bill. Thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this panel. It's not my area of expertise. So as you know, uh, my whole experience is, is in the private sector. I have spent the last 30 years restructuring companies that were either facing the pains of fast growth or were in deep financial and operational trouble and changing a corporate culture. And when changing a corporate culture, it's, it's, uh, it's always key in, in a restructuring. Uh, I had the opportunity to work with and interact with very different audiences, very different cultural groups, bankers, engineers, farmers, medical doctors, teachers, and so on. And the lesson is always the same. What I have learned is that there are some basic requirements to change a corporate culture, including <clears throat> towards sustainability. So one needs very clear strategies and objectives, also related to environmental issues, all well and extensively communicated. We need systems and procedures that reinforce these values, the strategies and objectives, for example, a variable compensation systems that rewards behavior consistent with your values and objectives. You need zero tolerance for detours on key values, especially when you are in a company that has uh, sensitive environmental issues. And most importantly, you need a management team that is intellectually honest and committed to these values, right? So leadership for me is the key. Because you do not change a corporate culture through speeches, but you do it through the example of the leadership. Corporate culture you change through everyday choices, decisions, and actions from management. That's how you change the culture. Uh, particularly in companies that by the nature of their activity are more sensitive to environmental issues. Uh, for example, I was CEO of Aracruz 20 years ago when uh, environmental issues were not uh, on, on the, the agenda, but for us it was very important because we were planting and cutting 50,000 trees every day and we have we had uh, very uh, um, in, uh, important customers like Procter & Gamble and Kimberly Clark that uh, kept us very honest in relation to environmental issues. So in a company like that, you have to change the culture, not, not uh, change of culture is not limited to your employees, but also extended to employees' families, especially children, as well as to the surrounding communities. 
So actions can include intelligent communication, recreational activities, training and development of teachers, development of joint projects with other companies through industry associations and so on. But at the end of the day, uh, when one thinks of changing behavior on a national or global level, companies have a limited impact, right? So perhaps I think that these concepts that we use to change the culture in a corporation or similar ones uh, could be applied to broader audiences at a national level. But once again, it depends essentially on leadership. Uh, I was just thinking, for example, of the recent vaccination challenges. Brazil, my home country, had traditionally very good results in campaigns such as controlling HIV, reducing smoking, and a very uh, proven vaccination system in place. However, when uh, COVID started, the president took a very negative attitude in relation to vaccination, and in spite of the very good systems in place, the outcome was negative. In contrast, in Portugal, where I'm currently living, the government took an active role in the vaccination process with the president, the prime minister, and other officials uh, constantly on TV communicating the benefits of uh, and importance of vaccination. They also supported their communications with extensive tools and systems for an efficient vaccination process. They were effective in communicating the risks of the disease and the benefits of the vaccine. And as a result, the population supported massively the vaccination campaigns. And so awareness was their true leadership. So in certain cases, as uh, in companies, uh, besides motivational programs and rewards, I think that zero tolerance and penalties could also help to change behavior. As for example, uh, safety belts, right? Uh, we had a situation where we had a strong communication process coupled with heavy fines for not using them. And gradually, the population changed behavior and using a safety belt to this a second nature. So companies, uh, finalizing companies, can support sustainable actions and even pressure political leaders. But at the end of the day, it's political leadership that will make a, a, a real change. And in that respect, I think that my other panelists have much more experience than I do. <laughs> well, thank you, Luis. Yeah, that, 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 that's a really that's a great points there. One is that <clears throat> we're not working in a vacuum. There are other experiences you pointed out, uh, you know, the seatbelt, smoking, vaccines, where we look at how popular culture interacts with real uh, policy and action uh, and can learn from that. In fact, I remember I was living in, in Italy uh, when the seatbelt law came in as part of becoming the, the EU back in 1989, and people w were uh, rebelling against that, wearing T-shirts with a, a, a fake seatbelt on it so they wouldn't get fined. <laughs> um, and uh, But so I think learning from, the, from, from those experiences is actually something that, that Mauricio can talk about of what are other uh, success stories, or, or even when things did not go, go correctly that we can learn from, um, but I did, before I hand it over to Mauricio, I did want to point out one other, um, I think, powerful message that you had, uh, Luis, is that a company <clears throat> really is kind of a microcosm of society. And you say you have, you have the different different groups, different um, uh, you know, uh, people uh, with different, you know, different mental models of, of the world, different behaviors. And how do you, do you bring them all together and get that alignment? Uh, you have obviously more tools with a corporate environment than necessarily... In, in most most societies, um, but the ability to work with all of those different groups, I think those are, are, are tools that that can be uh, very useful in thinking about how do we uh, change um, awareness at, at a more uh, societal impact. So I think there's a lot to learn from companies. And one final observation is, I find it very interesting uh, nowadays that em employees are looking and sometimes more towards their companies. Uh, to represent their interests uh, than to their governments. Uh, in many cases where the government has fallen short uh, of what the companies expect to happen. And of course, in the United States, we have many cases uh, of this, you know, even, even currently around uh, health care, uh, where they're saying we want the companies to be our voice and, and represent uh, our, our needs. Uh, so there's that, that interesting uh, ebb and flow between uh, how the company wants to influence employees how employees 
uh, influence uh, the companies. Company, yeah. Yeah. So, Mauricio, I, I think that there are all sorts of interesting experiences in, in Brazil, both with regard to sustainability, you know, directly, Brazil being a, a huge player, uh, not just regionally, but, but globally in environmental issues and, and thinking about it. Um, and then, as, as Luisa pointed out, uh, in, in Brazil, there may be uh, some other uh, success stories or um, stories that we can at least learn from uh, and changing uh, uh, public awareness that we can apply to sustainability. So we'd like to hear from you now. Okay, so thank you, uh, Will, and, and it's, a, it's, it's an honor to be here with you. And, uh, well, first of all, just to say, I, I'm based here in Brazil and I am the president of an institution which deals with uh, international relations between Brazil and other countries. So, um, and we are established in, in more than 20 countries right now, so we have this kind of overview of what's happening uh, in the different uh, areas of the world. And there's, there's something very, very interesting in what's being discussed here, because you see, uh, whenever we talk about uh, sustainability, especially environmental sustainability, uh, sustainability uh, we have these two, these two aspects, you know, the, 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 the corporate culture and the social culture you know, that you were mentioning. And uh, it's interesting because uh, for, for countries like, like Brazil, uh we were for a long time closed to the to the world you know, we, we we are a continental country so all the relations all the attention of, of the companies of people are basically focused on the, the internal issues of the, the, the country so and here we have a very different uh, uh environment you know, than the rest the rest of the world because uh, we have uh, tons of forests everywhere and uh, the, the the well the situation here is very different. So it's hard for people to build this kind of uh, uh, culture or to understand the necessity of, of uh, putting attention to things like this. And, uh, and it's interesting because uh, recent movements in the world economy, in Brazil's economy, uh, they are forcing uh, companies to open up uh, to the world. You know? So the globalization is taking a huge part on this changing of culture. Because you see, uh, as you said, as scientists, uh, we, we, we tend to believe in the rationality of people. You know, when it's said, well, it's easy, you just uh, show them the facts and the, their behavior will change. And this is not a reality, you know, because other pe uh, or people are not re uh, rational, or at least their elements of reasoning are different from the, the ones that we, we, we expected, you no, know, because. People are much more moved by the economic factors than the the the, the this, uh, social and uh, environmental understanding of the world, and uh, so that that's why we've been seeing not only Brazil but in many in many uh, other developing and underdeveloped countries, we've seen that the, the globalization is taking a huge part of this change of culture because you see whenever you start to open to the world and you start to to try to make business with uh, uh, companies uh, from abroad then you start to realize that things uh, uh, is being dealt uh, in a very different uh, way you know in a very serious way and uh, i remember Darren Oraz was the first time that i uh, when i met uh, it was his name is Robert Scharf, I believe, uh, he was the CEO of the Luxembourg Stock Exchange, and and he gave me his card, and in the back of the card was, uh, I, I believe, it, the, the the logo was green stock or something like this, and uh, it's already embedded on the name you know, of the stock exchange. This 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 uh, uh, attention to the green economy, and uh, and so as soon as uh, people and companies start to realize that they have to change their behavior, otherwise they will be out of the market. So this this has a huge impact. Uh, and we've been seeing this in many different countries. You see, actually also uh, regarding the social culture, because this is regarding uh, 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 the company's culture, but regarding social culture, this this already have been happening for, for I believe, a, a little longer. Uh, actually, for example, if you take our laws here in South America, in Brazil and other countries here, we've seen a, a huge development on this. So uh, the regulations on, on, 
on climate issues, on environmental issues, they are very well constructed. Not always they are well applied, but they are well constructed at least. And and even this this part of technology that Felix was mentioning, you know, here uh, I have a, a few country fields on my own. I, if you take one tree down, uh, on the next day there will be someone from the government there to understand what happened. Why didn't you ask for a permission to do that? And so uh, this this is interesting that because there's there's been a lot of development on this. Of course, it's a, a a huge country, for example, Brazil, and we, we've seen this international news uh, regarding environment uh, and uh, how our president here has a very different view on this. And uh, But but things are, are not quite as uh, we see on the news uh, abroad, no? because we, we really have like these strong regulations. We really have a lot of uh, um, technology to deal with this uh, right now. And so not to take too long, this this is just uh, the kind of message that I was trying to convey the, that uh, there are still a lot to be done and a lot to, to, to develop. But uh, I believe that socially this is happening already. And for the companies, uh, the globalization is push, pushing this very hard. Yes, thank you, Mauricio. Uh, and and I, I think that um, there are so many in- interesting aspects about you know, globalization and again, kind of a, a, an ebb and flow there as well, uh, where, you know, people like perhaps all of us had naturally uh, expected that the degree of globalization would just increase, you know, the, the Thomas Friedman uh, book, you know, some 20 years ago, you know, the world is flat, that we're taking w- away the barriers to trade and communication. And yet there now we have this big reaction against that <clears throat> and people trying to look more within their national boundaries and be more uh, autonomous. Um, so that there, there's, again, that, that kind of uh, push and, and pull. Uh, and you had the globalization perhaps uh, um, helping to spread ideas more quickly, uh, certainly in, in the past. Um, and I wonder, uh, what, what's, what's your opinion uh, about uh, the more nationalist uh, trends uh, in, in recent years uh, do you think that's going to impact the the flow of ideas, you know, particularly around uh, sustainability? Uh, well, uh, actually, it was for me the question, no? Yes, uh, to be sure. So, and then actually, I, want bring, I want to bring in Felix too on this because I know okay. Felix has a lot of international experience in very unusual parts of the world. Okay, so so what we've been uh, observing here is not it's uh, it's a stronger movement into not not uh, exactly to the nationalism but to regionalism, you no. Know? So we see uh, this this uh, this uh, focus of the antennas being uh, set to the the, the region that uh, the countries are in. So Europe is, is uh, getting stronger, and uh, South America and Asia and this kind of uh, relations. And uh, this is this is being a reality. But uh, on the other hand, I think uh, the pandemics also pushed a very strong change in this panorama. Because you see, uh, and this is something that I've been uh, saying uh, here in Brazil a lot, especially to to middle and small companies. You see, the world got together, you know, and, and despite of this regionalism uh, movements, uh, we kind of uh, gained access to the world uh, uh, in, in a way. Because you see, uh, for us here. For example, if we were trying to do some business with Europe or China, we would have to take this plane and to get there and to spend some days and the hotel and everything. And now we can participate in business fairs and uh, business rounds all over the world through our computer. So this actually opened up like a, a what I, I always like to say, this is a kind of a democratization of the world market. You know? So... Uh, Insta- uh, besides the fact that we are having this kind of movements uh, towards regionalism, I, I, I've, I've seen this, that uh, the pandemics and the digital world is connecting people more than ever. And uh, we've been uh, seeing a huge change in the, in the flows of everything in the international market. Yeah, and, and I think there's a lot of expectations, as you were pointing out, too, like the whole COVID pandemic, that now people can better understand global phenomenon like that like climate change and yeah, aspects exactly. of sustainability and and, and you know, hopefully that that is the case that we can learn both from what did work well in the pandemic and having that more global consciousness 
uh, versus the, the counterflow of regionalism. But Felix, I want to, I want to bring you in on, on the international aspect and, and uh, cultures, working across cultures, you know, from, again, the, um, the Western perspective in the past, you know, the big you know, sources of wealth and, and industrialization and a lot of kind of base knowledge is always like, oh, we have the knowledge. We just need to send it out uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, and the, the term in, in Brazil used to be, you know, tropicalization. We just need to adapt it to the lo- So here's the truth. And now we need to adapt it to the local culture. And boom, we're done. This is how the World Bank, you know, used to try to operate. So tell, tell us uh, about your, your experience and, and where that maybe has worked or maybe has fallen on its face and particularly with regard to uh, sustainability. Yeah, thanks, Bill. This is a fascinating topic and yeah, I'm happy to comment. Mauricio, just a quick comment though on, on your tree in your garden. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we need to look at facts and Brazil uh, obviously chopped down 430 square kilometers of Amazon forest in January this year alone. That's five times more than January previous year. So I think we just need to be real in terms of facts here. And, and we have a huge issue on our hands, but Bill, I think that that brings us to, to the topic, you know, can we just evangelize and everything will be fine? Probably not. Um, and look, in, uh, I've, I've uh, co-run um, a fund for frontier markets, as I mentioned in the beginning of the last eight years, and we chose an easy country, Afghanistan, um, to invest in, and see how we can develop companies there. And guess what? Our biggest competitor were the development agencies, the USAIDs, the diffits of this world, who just sort of threw money at it and told the world how to do things better. And guess what? Money gone. And impact negative in almost all instances. So yeah, we we were we were and we are fighting an uphill battle, not just because a country like Afghanistan is complicated and you need to understand you know how to do business there and who to deal with and who not to deal with, etc. But also because you've constantly got those sort of do gooders on the side making your life difficult and uh, and not understanding what's happening and creating a negative impact. So. Super interesting. We still managed to build a portfolio of six companies and each of these companies have become market leader in their sector. And the idea is to effectively create one market leader and change and develop the entire sector and really manage and measure impact based on the impact on the entire sector. So that's what we've been trying to do. Not easy, but working with local partners in the companies, local CEOs, local managers, and obviously, our team is to a large extent local as well. And that worked incredibly well, despite all the difficulties. And even with the change in government last year, our companies are still there. We're still employing over a thousand people in the companies today. We're getting their monthly salaries and feed, you know, a thousand families uh, as a result of that. That's what we thought is really, you know, sustainable development in the long term. Great, great stories. And, and boy, yeah, Afghanistan certainly... Um... A, a world unto it itself, uh, and, and it is remarkable how, with with really, I think the best of intentions, uh, so many organizations like you're talking about the, the bilateral, multilateral aid agencies, you know, going in, and just because of their own culture, uh, uh, they end up making things even even worse. Um, so uh, again, I think experiences that we can hopefully uh, learn from, and maybe it's really a question of how do we um, uh, you know, develop or, or help develop solutions that are more adapted to the local culture um, and then have a more of an exchange of ideas rather than an imposition, you know, not, not a north to south imposition, but maybe a marketplace. And maybe heresis is, is part of that because we come from all over the world. Uh, and that's very much so. I, I, I enjoy. Very much so. Before I hand it over to Luis, because I know, Luis, you, you have uh, again, a great international experience. So I want to throw out one thing that the Mauricio had mentioned about how we need to think differently, not just as scientists. So I know, what I've tried to do is actually uh, think differently by, by doing a picture book for children uh, with the intention of changing adult behavior. So using children and the power of narratives, not explaining facts to people, which tends not to work, amazing. Uh, but use a story, uh, use narrative, use, use something interesting uh, so that the children get engaged and then they engage the, the adults in their lives. So you can imagine 
uh, in Uwama, that it's a very serious policy for him. I said, I think our, our solution, uh, it may be a picture book, you know, that, 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 that go, goes over uh, <laughs> in a very interesting way in, in the beginning. But at least I want to get, get your, your thoughts as well in terms of... Uh, 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 we used uh, booklets similar to yours, not so sophisticated, uh, to give to the children of the employees and to the local co community and so on. But the reality in corporations is corporations react to external pressure, either pressure from the NGOs or requirements and demands from your clients and, uh, or from the government. So very unusual to have a, something to start within the corporation in terms of environmental issues. And uh, so you need uh, uh, some, some incentive, <laughs> some external incentive in terms of even rewards or penalties also for corporations to be uh, more active uh, in terms of, of, of environmental issues. There are some very limited corporations that have uh, leaderships that are, have a different mentality but that's not the, the standard, right? Not not the, the large majority of, of corporations. Yeah, and, and I think you know, especially Air Cruise is a great example of um, a, a, one single company with a huge influence over a specific region, you know, kind of the okay. classic company town where there's really not a whole lot of difference between your, your work life uh, and your personal life and the, those, those intermingle. And I think that and in many cases, maybe it's a question of, what are the leverage points in society to change awareness? In the case of Eric Cruz in, 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 in uh, Espiritu Santo, it's like if I can get to Luis Kaufman, <laughs> the CEO, uh, that's my leverage point because that's going to change how Eric Cruz looks at things and then how the community looks at things. It, but it, uh, another point... In, in, in our case, was very Procter & Gamble and Kimberly Clark represented a significant portion of our exports and they were very demanding. So you didn't have any choice. If you want to survive and keep doing business, you better behave, right? Right, right. So, 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 so many things as a result of that. You're right. So, so customers could be a leverage point. And right. I think in the greater, greater society, we can look for uh, influencers and sometimes they're political leaders, they're cultural leaders. Uh, and, you know, despite... I think some of the negative aspects of the cultural hegemony of the United States, um, th those might be levers we, we can use. Um, so as we say here, uh, see what the cool kids are doing and then try to influence the cool kids. Again, the cool kids could be uh, a president of a country uh, or it could be a, a cultural icon or it could be a business leader. And if you get these people like, you know, Bill Gates, uh, who's, who's not too far away from where I am, if you get him to speak about, climate change, then uh, that can uh, influence things uh, across uh, the globe. Uh, so I think as we move forward, looking for uh, what might be those, those leverage points to move um, social awareness around sustainability, that actually can create a stronger foundation for change uh, moving forward. So before we close, I just want to give the chance uh, for anyone who wants to pop in uh, to uh, uh, give, a, give a final word. Uh, shall I start with uh, you, Mauricio? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> we had to say that at least once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, well, I, I would just like to say that, uh, that as, as you said, I, I believe that discussions like this uh, that we're having in Urazis as a whole and in the Spanish specifically, I think uh, it has a huge importance on uh, this uh, changing of uh, the mindset of people and the behaviors. And... Of course, uh, as you mentioned, I, I believe that uh, the pandemics showed us that we are actually sitting in one world. You know? So uh, we are part of the same, the same thing. And uh, if we, we uh, understand this and start to consider the world as a whole, so I, I believe uh, people might change their minds if they are reasonable. <laughs> so, optimistic. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Felix, what, what are your final thoughts? Look, I think what we're seeing is that everything we do matters and the social awareness of what we do matters. You know, the fact that we have big countries run by populist governments is really matters, as you can see in the Amazon rainforest today. 
So we need to really, really work hard in our environments and all our networks everywhere we can to make sure social awareness about sustainability really is top of the priority list. Great. And Luis, you get the last, last word. <laughs> I would say, uh, how do you choose good leaders? And I think that how do you educate people to choose good leaders? <laughs> At the end of the day, that's what is going to make a difference. <laughs> that's great. Well, thank you very, uh, very much, everyone. Uh, it's a topic I'm very uh, enthusiastic about, uh, and I really appreciate uh, your contributions today. See you in Cascais next year. Right. Thank you, guys. Nice to meet you. Bye. 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 -bye.